Hi there, this is Solitude Ronan from Solitude Ronan Films and welcome to a response video to friend of the channel Chris Mohan's video about his life in film where he picks one film from every year of his life. He recently did part one which is 1978 to 1988 and I thought it would be an interesting exercise to do it myself but obviously because I'm not as smart as Chris I'm just going to do it in one go but there was some years that were difficult to just pick one film so I have cheated and picked two or three for some years it's interesting because obviously I'm not that experienced with modern films so the 2000s obviously I'm probably just missing a lot of films that I haven't seen but there was also not that many that stood out to me um, but again that's probably due to my ignorance rather than there not being lots of good films for specific years again I haven't seen every film from every year strangely enough so I've just picked films that are either some of my favourites or kind of have other importance. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life and a lot of poor decisions and this might be one of them. But anyway, here is my life in film, 1974 to 2019. I haven't included 2020 because quite frankly none of us are really living in 2020. Um, we'll look back in a few years and maybe do a 2020 special video but from now let's start from 1974 again I'm not really going to go through all the winner, the ones that could have won because obviously I've got some years with two or three the first one is The Taking of Pelham 123 Directed by Joseph Sargent, starring Robert Shaw and Walter Matthau, Martin Balsam. One of the best examples of a quintessentially 70s film. Another great example of how to do a heist movie well. It was remade um, atrociously. So for 1975, it's Jaws, despite the fact, obviously, it represents the birth of the blockbuster which I'm obviously not a fan of and it's a Steven Spielberg fan it's a Steven Spielberg fan it's a Steven Spielberg film and again I'm not a huge fan of Spielberg either but it's a film that is just about perfect it's a film of classic moment after classic moment and it's a film where Spielberg actually does things with the camera where's that gone? For 1976, it's Richard Lester's Robin and Marion, starring a smorgasbord of actors, including the recently departed Sean Connery, Robert Shaw, Audrey Hepburn, um, Ronnie Barker, Denham Elliott, Nicka Williamson, Ian Holm, Richard Harris. Um, again, Seeing this as my life in film, it's quite appropriate. It's a film about growing old. Um, again, five, ten years ago, it wouldn't be on this list. But seeing it again, um, done a video on it, I think. Um, certainly mentioned it in the joint podcast, Ronan Nazarin Talks, where we did an episode on Richard Lester. It's just an amazing film that you do appreciate the older you get. 1977, the year of Star Wars, so obviously it's a razor head like David Lynch. Again, perhaps not David Lynch's best film, 
Um, not everybody can tell what it's about, but its legacy remains. Apart from anything else, it's the birth of one of the great singular voices in cinema. Because David Lynch is one of the few directors that if you take away all the other films ever made, David Lynch would still make films because he's not really influenced by other filmmakers. He's certainly more influenced by painting, but he's not really influenced by other filmmakers like so many filmmakers are. 1978 is Paul Schrader's Blue Collar. Again, one of the reasons is, apart from the fact it's one of the best debuts of all time, is the fact that it's still relevant. It's about how workers are divided and how people in general are divided by any means necessary to keep them down. Um, it's still resonant. It's one of the first indicators I ever bought. Um, it's a stunning film with great performances by... Richard Pryor in a serious role, Yafit Koto and Harvey Keitel. 1979, again, most of these years are really good years. It's Tarkovsky's Stalker. This one didn't make into my favourite 150, but if I do the list again next year, it probably will. Um, it's just a metaphysical, mind-bending experience, it's about atmosphere and about the polar opposite of science fiction, Star Wars as you could possibly get. 1980, again this was the first year that I had problems so I've put two films up. One is probably predictable, the other perhaps not quite so. So the first one is Flash Gordon Obviously, in the year of Empire Strikes Back, it's Flash Gordon. Again, Ronan Nazrin Talks podcast with Nazrin Prod. We did a whole episode on Flash Gordon. Just an amazing film on so many levels. Not the least for Max von Sydow. And the other film from 1980 that I couldn't not include is Alan Resney's My American Uncle which is just a masterpiece in every level. Again, I really need to do a separate video on this because this has been in 150 as well. Um, it's a film that will make you question your own existence and your own behaviour. 1981 wasn't the best year, in my opinion, um, but the film is my year anyway is Thief by Michael Mann his first really great film um, I think a really good performance by James Caan a lot of the the Michael Mann tropes and templates are in here and it's a very early appearance by Dennis Farina 1982 you can all guess which one this will be in the year of E.T., it's The Thing. Obviously Blade Runner is pretty close. But The Thing, um, just because I have about 14 different editions, this is the new HMV Japanese logo steelbook. Um, yeah, there's not much more to say about The Thing, apart from one of the greatest remakes of all time, one of the best physical special effects of all time, one of the greatest ensemble cast performances of all time, and how to direct an ensemble cast, how to create an atmosphere of dread, John Carpenter's best film. Yeah, shunned on its release, but it's amazing. 1983, again not the best year I believe, obviously you can correct me if I'm wrong, this is Cronenberg's Videodrome in the nice Criterion videotape-like box. Again, perhaps not Cronenberg's best film, but as with most Cronenberg films, ahead of its time, James Woods gives a great performance, as does Deborah Harry, bizarrely, um, about the, the evils of television. 
and mind control, at least we don't have to worry about that nowadays. 1984, again, another great year, but just because who I am and my history with it, it has to be this is Spinal Tap. It's a film that I've probably seen, well, at least 50 times, I would have thought. Um, the hour and a half of extras you could just put into the film. I wish they would do a super cut uh, before Rob Reiner dies and do like a three hour super cut of Spinal Tap because the extra material is just as good as the main material. If you're a fan of rock and heavy metal music, there's so many little details that are just wonderful. It's got a bang on script, great performances. Um, yeah, Spinal Tap just had to win basically. 1985, another really good year, but for me there's only one clear winner that's finally getting more publicity, and that's of course Come and See by Elaine Klimov. For me, the greatest war film ever made. Um, no jingoism, no heroics, no glamorisation of weaponry and militarism. This is just pure horror. Um, one scene never forgotten. Probably give you nightmares. But that's war, folks. 1986, again, I had a lot of problems with. So I did two. And first is Michael Mann's Manhunter. Arguably the best serial killer film of all time. Easily the best Hannibal Lecter film of all time, even though he's only in it for two scenes. Um, again, full of Michael Mann goodness from the shot composition of putting objects in the foreground, focusing on strange things. Um, great performances by everybody, William Peterson, intense. Um, Joan Allen in, I believe, her first film, Kim Grace when she was big. Um, Dennis Farina, Stephen Lang, Tom Noonan as the Tooth Fairy is awesome. So the other film from 1986 that I couldn't really separate from Manhunter was David Lynch's Blue Velvet. Not really anything you can say about Blue Velvet. This was his um, comeback after June and he came back with a lovely little film about a nice little American town. 1987 again was a tough one. Um, so... Uh, just checking out and did three. These are my rules, this is my video, so I've done three films. First is Predator, which again you could argue is not a great film, but it's a film that I've seen countless times. Um, it works as an action science fiction classic as well as a satire on the whole genre. Yes, very much like the Aliens films, once it gets to one person against the Predator, one person against the alien, it's not as interesting as when the ensemble cast is there. But it's too important a film in my life. And this is my life in film. Um, the other 1987 film that I couldn't separate is Withnell and I. Arguably the best British film in the last 30 years. One of the greatest scripts of all time, one of the funniest films of all time, even though there's no jokes in it. Um, Richard E. Grant has pretty much been playing this character his entire career. Paul McGann's wonderful, Ralph Brown and Richard Griffiths. Bruce Robinson's greatest achievement. And finally, the film from 1987, which I just couldn't separate, is John Sayles' Mate One, which one of the highlights of my life is actually... Mate one getting a Criterion edition. Um, you should buy this and listen to the commentary. It's awesome. And watch the film, which is awesome. I've done videos on that. Don't need to go over it again. 1988, again, I couldn't separate three. Yes, I'm a dirty coward. First is George Slusey's Vanishing, which again is one of the greatest serial killer films. Um, completely mundane as most serial killers are. There's no great speeches and glamorising serial killers that some films tend to do at times. This is just blood-curdling... Blood-curdling... Nope. It's really mundane. 
but that's what makes it so chilling. And the second one from 1988, which I couldn't separate, is Cronenberg's Dead Ringers, which is a total masterpiece about twin gynaecologists with a great twin performance by Jeremy Irons, um, and of course his twin brother Jeff Irons. And finally the film from 1988, which I couldn't separate from the other two, is Midnight Run with Robert De Niro and Charles Grodin and Yafit Koto, which is literally perfect. It's one of those films that's just perfect. It's your classic odd couple being chased across the country by the mafia and the police, and at the end they have some respect, but it's not like cheesy and emotional. It's like two hours and it absolutely flies by. The script is just absolutely amazing. And the performances are great. De Niro proves he can do comedy without mugging it too much. Um, yeah, just a wonderful film from 1988. 1989, I'm cheating again. But two of these episodes did get a theatrical release. And in general it is counted as like ten films together to make one big smorgasbord of film. And that's Decalogue by Shizlovsky. Again, there was a bunch of good stuff in 1989. But nothing compares to Decalogue um, as far as just an absolute load of wonderfulness. 1990 is Miller's Crossing, my favourite Coen Brothers film. And for me, the Coen Brothers film that's absolutely perfect. Again, an amazing script, great performances, beautiful language that the Coen Brothers create, production design is amazing, it's just such a beautiful film and a truly great film and it's hard to believe this was the third film and it came after Raising Arizona, so from Raising Arizona to this perfect polished masterpiece is just amazing. So 1991 again, this is one of the cop out years I couldn't separate three films. So we first have Atom McGoin's The Adjuster with Elias Coteus, which is just subversive and dirty and wonderful. David Mamet's best film, in my opinion, Homicide, one of the best films about race relations in America, starring um, lots of regulars, Joe Mantegna, um, and William H. Macy, before he was kind of famous. And finally, another John Sayles, is City of Hope. In this obviously made up DVD release, because you can't fucking get it on Blu-ray or DVD. Somebody please do something about that. Um, how a city works from the top to the bottom in two and a bit hours with great sales characters and great sales dialogue. 1992, again, is a cheat year. First one is Glengarry Glen Ross, a mammoth script, James Foley's claustrophobic direction, a cast to die for, language, even if it's foul quite a lot of the time, like poetry. I like Baldwin's finest performance and he's only on the screen for eight minutes. It's just one of the great stories about working for a living. You could watch this in Blue Collar together as a wonderful double bill. The only film I've ever had on headphones on a C90 cassette that I used to listen to. For young people, you used to have cassettes that you like put your earphones in. You actually recorded stuff on cassettes. Crazy. Another 1992 film that I just could not separate from Glen Gary Glen Ross is Passion Fish. Another John Sayles film, starring Alfred Woodard and Mary McDonnell and David Strathairn, about a soap opera actress who's paralysed and returns to her Louisiana home um, and goes through a succession of home helps, the last of which is Alfred Woodard. Again, sounds amazing, doesn't it? Well, it is amazing. Um, 
arguably his best film, but there's a bunch of sales films that I would say are arguably his best film. Again, somebody release that in Blu-ray, please. Um, where are we at? 1993. Again, I'm cheating. Shazlovsky's Three Colours Blue, which is a big fat masterpiece. Um, Juliette Binoche. Music by Spigny Preisner is absolutely beautiful. And the other one from 1993 is The Age of Innocence. For me, my favourite Scorsese film and Scorsese's best film, in my opinion. Um, Daniel Day-Lewis and Michelle Pfeiffer. It's just absolutely beautiful. Um, Daniel Day-Lewis spends the whole film thinking he's the smartest person in the room, and he's not. We've all been there. 1994. It's Shizlovsky's Three Colours Red. No need to explain that. 1995. Michael Mann's Heat. A bit flabby, but still just amazing to look at and listen to. 1996. Cronenberg's Crash. I almost put another John Sayles film, Lone Star, but I didn't. I relented with Crash. Subversive. Intelligent. It's Cronenberg. The Arrow 4K and Blu-ray will be coming soon. 1997. Um, I will stop with John Sayles films, but not now. 1997, Men With Guns. His reaction to getting a Oscar nomination for the script for Lone Star was to do a film with all subtitles um, in an unnamed Central American country. A doctor tries to find his students out in the countryside. Um, the hubris um, of intelligence, even though it's ignorance. It's a road movie and it's absolutely beautiful. Federico Lippi's performance is enchanting. Despite his flaws, we root for him, um, and it's another great sales film. But obviously, I'm biased. 1998, again, I couldn't separate two, even though one probably is the greater film, but two I just love, so tough. It's The Legend of 1900 by Giuseppe Tornatari. Tornatori, even. Apologise. Um, more famous for Cinema Paradiso, but for me this is... This is um, better than Cinema Paradiso. Starring Tim Roth as a young boy who spends his whole life on a boat and becomes a master piano player. Shouldn't work, but it's just an absolute joy. I suggest you find the director's cut, which is like an extra hour almost. It's absolutely magnificent. And it's one of the greatest Ennio Morricone scores of all time, and that's saying something. And the other film from 1998... In the year of Saving Private Ryan is, of course, Within Red Line by Terence Malick, which is just amazing. Um, my favourite Malick film about the effect of war on the whole earth, not just men, women and children. 1999... There was a few, but The Straight Story by David Lynch. There seems to be quite a few David Lynch films in this. Um, on the surface, not a David Lynch film. It's a used certificate about an old man who goes cross-country to see his brother on the back of a lawnmower. But in a lot of ways, it's completely a David Lynch film. It's got a wonderful score from Angelo Badalamenti. Great performance by Richard Fansworth, Sissy Spacek, um, Harry Dean Stanton turns up at the end. It's a lovely little film that really needs a a prop or not proper blu release. This is a Spanish Blu-ray that you have to move the subtitles off the screen to actually get them off the screen. Um yeah, I'm not sure why this doesn't have a an English language um region A or B release. All the other David Lynch films do. The year two thousand. This is where it gets a little bit weird. So almost famous 
I haven't seen a lot of Cameron Crowe films, but this is easily my favourite. About the music business in the 70s. Just an absolute treat. Wasn't expecting it to be this amazing, but it is. It's just fantastic. Again, you're better watching the director's cut, which is like a full... Probably about an hour 40 minutes, but it works seamlessly. 2001. It's another David Lynch film. It's amazing how many David Lynch and Michael Mann films seem to be in this. Um, Mulholland Drive. Silencio, it's Mulholland Drive. Yeah, creepy, disturbing. Chinese puzzle of a film. 2002. Stephen Freer's Dirty Pretty Things. By Chiwetel Ejiofor and Audrey Tatto about the underbelly of London society, the service industry and hotels, and it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, a GG4 is a Nigerian doctor who has to work as a taxi driver and work in a hotel. It's, it's a beautiful, disturbing look film. Where are we at? 2003. You may scoff. Master and Commander of the Far Side of the World by Peter Weir, starring Russell Crowe. You could argue, yes, this is proof that I haven't seen lots of films in the 2000s. But this is such a good film that, again, is, I think, forgotten about and underrated. Um, but if you see it on the biggest screen you possibly can, it's a really good film. 2005. Again, there wasn't a lot of choices for me. Again, you can put in your list of 2005 and I'm sure there's lots of films that I just haven't seen. Dead Man's Shoes, which is just a wonderful little film. Again, I haven't seen all of Shane Meadows' work, but this, I think, is probably his best. A Tale of Revenge starring Paddy Considine. Um, it has a kind of lyrical, poetic feel to it an old-fashioned feel to it, even though it's quite brutal. 2000... sorry, that was 2004. This is 2005. Bittersweet Life. Uh, Kim Ji-Woon. Awesome. I think I've done a video on it. Nazrin Prod's done a video on it. Um, it was in my favourite 150. Just a, a stonking film. Next from 2006, it's another Michael Mann film, it's Miami Vice. Again, I think, so underappreciated when it came out. Everybody hated it because it wasn't like the 80s TV show. But if you know Michael Mann, it was never going to be the 80s TV show. I think, I could be wrong, but I think the Ben Stiller, Starsky and Hutch was out before this. So for some reason people thought, this would be similar to that. But of course it's Michael Mann, so it's not going to be. It's absolutely beautiful, sounds beautiful. Two people I'm not a big fan of, Colin Farrell and Jamie Foxx, are wonderful in it. Um, and I just think, over the years, Miami Vice is just going to go up in people's estimations. 2007. No Country for Old Men by the Coen Brothers. Which, again, is probably perfect apart from one scene that I really don't like. I love how it ends. I love the fact there's no music, there's no score. Woody Harrison again turns up a nice little performance. Josh Brolin's wonderful in it. Um, Javier Bardem is the force of nature. Killer. I don't know whether did he win the Oscar for it? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, really good. Tommy Lee Jones is really good in it even though sometimes I'm not a Tom Lee Jones hand. 2008 is Wally, -E, a beautiful Pixar film. Again, let me know what films should be. I should be watching from 2000, the 2000s because you can tell um, I haven't seen every film from the 2000s. 2009, another animated, it's Coraline. Which is just a joy, even though it's really too dark for children. 
2010 is Denis Villeneuve's Encendie, which when I saw it first just absolutely blew me away. Um, a story about the impact of war on families as we kind of flip flop from the past and the present as a brother and sister want to find their father and brother who they thought were both dead. It's just a sensational film. It's a slow burn, if you'll pardon the pun. But if you go with it and you stick with it and you don't try and jump too far ahead in the plot, it's a devastating film. You know, Villeneuve is one of the best directors out there at the moment. His films perhaps aren't, you know, masterpieces or anything, but he's intelligent. He actually expects the audience to pay attention, which not all filmmakers do. He doesn't insult the audience, which not all filmmakers do. And Onson D is just awesome. 2011 was a difficult year for me. But I've went with Samsara, which is the follow-up to Baraka in 2003. Perhaps not as amazing as Baraka, but still fairly mind-blowing. Again, just images from around the world. Again, see it on the biggest screen you possibly can, because some of it is absolutely breathtaking. 2012 will be no surprise to anybody who has watched my channel before, because I've talked about it countless times. Joshua Oppenheimer's documentary The Act of Killing, which might be the best film of the 2000s. Just a stunning piece of work. Again, watch the director's cut. The theatrical cut's 115 minutes, the director's cut's 159, so again, it's like... 45 minutes of extra stuff. It's just stunning um, about genocide and getting the killers to reenact their acts of murder through interpretive dance and song. Yep. At times you go, why am I watching this? this should, should I be watching this? And then it hits you like a sledgehammer. 2013 Jarmish, he's only lovers left alive. Again, I've talked about this a lot on the channel as well. Just a beautiful, amazing film. Um, you could argue, you know, vampire films, surely you can't put another spin on it. But Jarmish does it with aplomb. You know, the idea of these people have been around for 200, 400 years. And just think of all the culture, all the art, all the literature, all the music that they've soaked in over that time. It's just a beautiful film. Again, Tom Hiddleston isn't my favourite actor in the world, but he's good in this, and obviously Tilda Swinton is awesome as ever. 2014 is Two Days, One Night by the Dardenne Brothers, which I've done a video on. Again, another important film about working for a living, and kind of the state of working for a living in the 21st century. It's just a beautiful film, great performance by Marion Cotillard. Um, simple, documentary-like shot, there's no frills, no glamour, um, but just truth. 2015, again this won't be any surprise to anybody, Yorgos Lanthimos, or for me the greatest director of the moment. The Lobster with Colin Farrell again, who I'm not a big fan of, but he's very good in this. And Rachel Weiss, who I'm not a big fan of, but is very good in this. Again, I've done a video on that. You can look it up for plot synopsis um, in other places. 2016 is Dennis Villeneuve's Arrival, an intelligent science fiction film about Aliens appearing um, with Amy Adams and Jeremy Renner, again, I'm not the biggest fan of, but worked well in this, Forrest Whitaker's in it as well. Just a beautiful, intelligent film. I know they're, they're not ten a penny anymore. Um, 2017, it's another Lanthimos, it's the killing of a sacred deer. Again with Colin Farrell, who I'm not the biggest fan of, and Nicole Kidman. This is another um, 
troubling, dark, odd film by Lanthimos, but it's just wonderful. 2018, this is beginning to sound like a broken record. It's the favourite by Yorgos Lanthimos. Um, yes, you could argue I haven't seen enough films, that's why Lanthimos keeps um, getting the film of the year. It's a period costume drama, and I know that puts a lot of people on high alert. But this is Lanthimos. I, I was full of trepidation as well, just because it got Oscar nods. Um, I thought this might not be Lanthimos at his best, but it is. There's great performances by everybody involved. It looks absolutely beautiful. It will remind you of Barry Lyndon. It's, it's wonderful. And 2019 is Parasite. Um, again, I haven't seen lots and lots and lots of films from the, well, certainly the 2010s. Um, but Bong Joon Ho's Parasite is really good. Again, I was, I had trepidation because obviously it won the Oscar. And usually that's not a good sign. But it's just, it's wonderful. Um, it's got a lot to say. Um, Song Kang Ho is wonderful as always. So that's 2019. Again, I'm not doing 2020 because who among us is actually alive? And that's that's my life in film. Again, I did not spend days researching this, so there's probably films that I've completely forgotten about, and I apologise. Again, I have not seen every single film that was made in every single year between the years of 1974 and 2019. But you can... Give me your suggestions for each year, because um, that would be an interesting exercise as well. It was an interesting exercise, so thanks Chris Mohan. I'll put the link to his video in the description below. Go check out his channel and subscribe if you haven't already. And yeah, let me know in the comments what years I'm missing and what films I'm missing from those years. This is Solitary Ronan from Solitary Ronan Films wondering what on earth I've got myself in for, saying farewell. <laughs>